Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to finish off today with a special selection, and that's where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. If you'd like to submit your own special selection, you can do so in the link in the description. Today's selection comes at us from Will. It says, the special selection this time is one of my personal favorites, Seven Gates by Carfagan. It can be found on their website. It's 28 minutes. A symphonic or art prog piece that explores many sounds and ideas. The man behind it, Anthony Kalugan, cranks out many albums and songs under three different artists, and all of it is worth a listen. So, let's dive into this. We have some Carfagan. The track is Seven Gates. As Will stated, it's 28 and a half minutes, so pause the video, get a snack, get some water, get comfy. Let's dive in. Good evening, my friends. There's a candle burning bright That's just for you and me When the light disappears You have nothing to fear That candle's light for me and you That candle burns ever bright So my heart is light again. It's in the perception. It's a very interesting collection of sounds so far, but I'm really waiting to see what happens after this introduction. Okay. Very interesting uh, idea in a five. Emphasizing one, two, and four, and just leaving these pockets of space otherwise.
really like that bass vibe. It's present, it has a nice tone to it. And it's also interesting to hear this song constantly jumping back and forth between being kind of froggy and being really groovy and funky. Nice little fermata there to make the five feel a bit longer as we move into this new idea. Ooh, 11 8. 5 4 with an extra eighth note on it. Gotta have a flute. Gotta have a flute. So it's interesting, uh, we're like six minutes into this track, maybe like four minutes into the song itself, heavy emphasis on this five feeling, and the song is called Seven Gates. Really beautiful atmosphere and vibes that are created in all of these sections so far. It's just a, a really nice combination of timbres. It's a very natural element to a lot of these timbres as well. Harps unprocessed drums, flutes, Shift down a little bit, mellow it out. It's interesting the first time we moved away from this five happens to be when we've also shifted emotion. There's more wonder to this, uh, to this section. It's not uh, the bright and cheerful thing we have seen previously. That bass still has a really nice presence, so... Yeah. 
what an interesting combination of timbres, too. Some folk, some acoustic, uh, some electric, and I think even some digital. Really nice space on this drumming right here. Back to that 11. Never really wants to get to 6. Really nice layering there of timbres. We brought in the flute and lined it up with the piano, I think it was. Foreshadowing the flute, giving a moment to introduce itself before leading the section. Really nice structure there. And a bit of a jig. back a lot of the earlier vibes, bass is killing it again. We got a glockenspiel back there. Huge twist. So many elements got swapped here. Instrumentation, uh, atmosphere, texture.
like the crickets. <laughs> yeah, I like how that line's getting passed around between different groupings of instruments. A tiny key shift has completely shifted all of the feeling here, but we've also gotten rid of that uh, that background sound as well. It's brightened up a brightened it up a bit rather than kind of holding it down. It's the tiny nuances that Anthony uses to keep the song progressing forward. Yeah, so that was a really nice 16 bar interlude that brought us from the previous sort of sitting in the desert at night kind of vibe to where we are now. Random triangle hit. <laughs> you have to come along this way. You have to thrust the hand of fate. Yeah, bringing that uh, that little two beat motif back. So that last section was in six when we had that uh, da da da. And that was in four. Man, I'm waiting for the seven time signature. I am. We just talked about seven wonders, the song Seven Gates. Where's my seven eight or seven four? like this groove and for some reason it just reminded me of like a polyphia groove I got the organ in here, really giving it that uh, that retro prog idea. Yeah, it 
comes down just like a half step of a key and really kind of digs into a bit of instability before rising back up. Love it. I gotta go back and see if that little idea, that motif has been present through a lot of the songs. Just getting a lot of use here in the last half. All that power and stability, and then that little tinge of instability before bringing it back in, which makes it feel such, it's, it's such a powerful little, uh, little idea there. Back to the power, yeah, I really like that idea. Simple four bar phrase, but it just has a really nice uh, loop to it. <laughs> marching idea with the marching flute or marching snare. left the space there. Interesting. I've been conditioned to hear the, <laughs> to hear the lead up into that now. Oh, but it was there that time. <laughs> That little motif is all throughout this song in all sorts of places. The bells went dun dun dun. It was inverted. The same spacing between the notes, though. Seven because it's when we made it to the next wonder. We made it past the gate into what we've been searching for. This would have been the place to have seven in the time signature. Building up the majesty of this place.
What an odd ending. Maybe there's something that uh, Anthony's trying to say with the ending. Narratively, as far as the adventure of the song goes, but musically, that song ended about a minute earlier with that really nice, resolved uh, orchestral note. I think it was brass and strings, maybe. Just gets that nice, warm period put on the song, and then it faded into silence, but we still had like 40 seconds left on the song, and then it just kind of tacked on this thing, and, um, you know, it had some elements that we have seen previously in the song, so I'm wondering, uh, you know, if it means something narratively, because it didn't, it wasn't just brand new content, it was a, a remix of other stuff we had seen taking ideas previously and injecting it into a new context that tells me that he has an idea for this, what it might represent narratively or thematically uh, in the story that he's trying to tell, but, I mean... Hmm, just kind of a, a strange way to end that one, as far as I'm concerned. Alright, so as usual, uh, we are going to, or I'm going to be diving into this on more of a surface level read, just because it is incredibly long, incredibly dense, there is a lot of pieces to this song, a lot of sections, and each of those sections have a lot of things going on in them. I'm not going to be able to do as deep of a dive on something like this as I would, uh, you know, a four to seven minute track. Uh, that might follow more of a standard song structure that I can kind of see repetitions and patterns and, uh, you know, kind of disregard the repeated information so I can really focus down on what's new, which is going to be a smaller amount of information than <laughs> this incredibly dense work of art. So, yeah, like I said, more of a surface read on this, but that doesn't mean I, that doesn't mean that it's going to be any less shorter than or or less in depth i suppose you could say uh less thorough than my usual stuff so first thing i want to start with that really caught my attention was instrumentation and i had touched on it a little bit in the video but there's just a lot of timbres going on in this track and they are all over the place as far as uh, style, I think, is a good word for it. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of 70s prog inspiration in here. We have organs. We might even have a moog or something that sounds similar to it. Um, we have electric guitars, both with a little bit of crunch and distortion on it and clean. We have acoustic guitars. We have some vocals. There's some piano. There's the drum kit. There's the bass. So we have this sort of modern electric um, in uh, instrumentation going on with the rock band stuff. But there's also a lot of folk elements going on as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I heard an accordion. Um, there were some flutes. Uh, there were some really nice drum tones that sounded completely unedited. And they didn't sound like drum kits where they're made out of steel and stuff. They sounded more like uh, wooden drums, possibly with some sort of uh, a stretched uh, drum head, not like a, a pro not like a mass produced drum head, but something a little more traditionally created. Um, just had a really nice, warm, earthy kind of tone to it, rather than the more uh, metallic kind of sound that we hear from modern day drum kit, uh, toms and snares. Um, it might also just been all wood come to think of it and been like a, a hand played drum rather than something that you would use a mallet for. Um, but honestly, that's only one drum sound that I'm thinking of. And there were a ton of drum sounds in here. It's very possible that there were some that were mallet based. Um, so yeah, we had quite a few of those. Uh, there might have even been a lute or a lyre in there as well. 
Um, just like basically an old timey kind of guitar, folky guitar. Then there were also orchestral elements. We had that big brass and string ending. Uh, we had a glockenspiel at one point. Uh, we had the flute part, but not like a tin whistle that we heard in some sections, more like a traditional modern orchestral flute. And then, of course, I think there were some uh, electronic elements in here. There were definitely uh, atmospheric samples being used, like the crickets. Uh, but I also think I heard some pads, synthesizer pads, being used in a couple of sections as well. So there's just a wide a range of instrumentation going into this that expands far outside beyond one style. It's not rock. It's not folk. It's not orchestral. Uh, or classical, it's not electronic. It is a little bit of everything uh, whenever one section or style or sound is needed and another is not, or whenever they need to be combined. Uh, Antony does not seem to have any issues with mixing and matching the sort of uh, styles or environments that these different timbres kind of uh, uh, lend themselves to. And we end up hearing some very interesting sections that mix instruments from all the groups. Uh, and I absolutely love the a little bit of novelty, but also just the unexpectedness. How I never know what the next section could bring because he has such a large palette and has no problem mixing any of the colors on it. Uh, that's, that's an art metaphor. There's no, there's no actual colors in this music. <laughs> um, although... No, we're timbre technically can be described in color, but that's a conversation for a different day. Um, but yeah, so yeah, he just has he has a massive toolbox, lots of things in there to choose from, and and he just mixes and matches whatever is striking his fancy for a moment, or whatever sounds in his head that he wants to bring to you know reality, whatever sounds that might mix, and I absolutely love that that just unexpected element of anything could happen. Um, and it also just created a lot of really cool soundscapes that I don't think I would have heard otherwise. Uh, you know, like I said, there's very few times that I'm going to hear a rock drum kit with uh, a proggy electric guitar tone and <laughs> some hand-played drums with a tin flute and a full violin section with some clean vocals. Like, that's not something I can find very, very commonly uh, in other music. So there's just a lot of really interesting things going on here that I don't have a lot of experience listening to. And I think that's fascinating just even by itself. Um, atmosphere. I, I took some notes just because it's so long and I want to make sure I get to everything uh, that I was thinking. So yeah, Atmosphere is next. And I think that this is the part that, uh, it was a couple sections into the song, and I realized that Anthony is brilliant. <laughs> he might even be a musical genius. Um, and that's not to say he didn't work for that. I'm not saying that like some sort of stuff. He probably went to a lot of schooling for this. Or if he didn't, then maybe he just has this amazing natural inclination for music. But... He goes through so many, th th the overall idea here is just variety. I think every <laughs> everything I'm going to talk about it is just a sheer variety in this song. But he goes through so many different atmospheres and emotions and feelings throughout the song, and they're all created by a variety of uses of different chord progressions, inversions of chord progressions, and music and notational relationship to the chords themselves. Um, and what I mean by that is that you can, you can make a sad sounding chord progression, all right? We, we have theory that will tell you that if you play a certain set of chords in a certain order, they will evoke certain emotions. But the thing is, is that the, the melody line also plays off of that and can reduce the emotional impact or increase it based on what notes are being used. You can even use notes from other keys, kind of color outside of the lines a little bit, to amplify or remove 
some of the impact of what the chord's doing. So the melody line, the, the singular notes existing outside of these triads, or however notes you're actually putting into your chords, uh, has just as much power over the emotion of a section as the chord progression itself does. The chord progression mostly, um, I guess it's like a coloring book, right? This is gonna be weird. I hope this makes sense. So the coloring, the, the lines, the outline of the picture is gonna be your chord progression. The colors you use and whether you choose to stay within the lines that have been outlined or you choose to add more to it, whether it's chaos and garbage, you just you know randomly color outside the lines, or you actually add your own elements outside of it. Maybe you draw extra pictures to go with what's been outlined. That's your melody line, right? So it can build on or remove from the core picture that has been created with the with the chord progression. That's what it. The chord progression tells the feeling, the the core idea that's going on with the music. Your melody line is the one that really sells it. Um, and Anthony Anthony just has a fantastic sense of both of these elements and how to use both of them. Just his musical uh, connection is just so strong and he can go through all of these little areas and change up minor things and use some really fun chords to create a diverse uh, set of atmospheres throughout all these sections. And it really is phenomenal to hear just how many different types of progressions uh, and interesting chords he utilizes in here. He has such a strong understanding of chord theory that, um, you know, this is just, it's a, it's a master class in how to incorporate so many varying uh, ideas as far as quarterly, as far as chords go into a single song while keeping it feeling cohesive. He has just enough connection from one idea to the next as far as the chords go or as far as the melodic line implies that the key might be to make everything sort of flow together from one idea to the next while also drastically changing up some of these ideas. Uh, I had mentioned somewhere in the middle, uh, it was the first real somber part, maybe like eight minutes in or something, you know, we had all this majestic or adventurous, bright and uplifting kind of stuff going on, and we hit this first mellow section. And we shifted the key just a hair uh, which kind of brought us out from this mellow into sort of uh, dangerously adventurous kind of vibe. And then that brought us into back into that, you know, high adventure kind of fun uh, idea going on. And it was about, you know, changing a couple chords at a time to slowly transition us into this new idea. And it's just like I said, he has such a strong grasp on chordal structures and how to develop them across a song. It is, um, I would love to break this song, well, probably have the song broken down for me. I, I do not have the ear to transpose something like this, um, but be able to see how the chords evolve uh, across the song, because I'm sure there's a lot to be learned just from studying this song alone. It's fascinating in that regard. Um, and that kind of leads into my next idea, which is phrasing. The phrasing in this, it's uh, the musical phrasing, basically melody lines. You know, looking at how a melody uh, evolves and changes and looking at the variety. Again, variety is just a, a lot of stuff going on in this song of his melody lines. And I absolutely love how almost all of them have this phenomenal flow to them that help ease you into the emotions, help you hit the high points, the climax of these emotions, and also find really nice ways to use uh, diminishing action to resolve the stories that are being told, the minute stories of just the melody lines in these sections. But also how the melody lines are also used as transitory ideas. And they may, they may guide us into the next idea. There is one section that I can't point out. Usually, I have, I have like a rough time, you know, about the 12-minute mark or like four four movements. In. No, I have no idea where this, where this section happened. Um, 
But the flu, I think I mentioned it though, which is the only reason I remember it. The flu actually came in like four bars early and started playing along with one of the instruments, a guitar or piano maybe, and um, took that idea and changed it up, mutated it just a hair to what would become the flute's lead melody line in the next section. And the next section was a bit of a, dr a drastic change as far as atmosphere or instrumentation. I don't remember what was different about it, but it was a very different feeling section. But it had this beautiful flow because the flute was introduced a bar early or a couple bars early. And, um, you know, we got to hear this instrument while also hearing it take this melody that we had already been uh, familiar with, accustomed to bring it into the next idea and slowly changing it a bit to become the next idea. And again, it's just the flow of melody. And also utilizing melody not just as a narrative tool, but also as a mechanical tool. It is there as a transitory phrase. It helps us move from one idea to the next. In that sense, it's very functional. But it also ends up becoming very musical, where it becomes the lead line that influences the emotional aspect of the next section. It's just, again, it's just this massive understanding of the tools that can be utilized and how best to apply those tools for maximum uh, efficiency. And it happens all over the place. Like That's the one that, that really stuck out to me, but I'm sure if you go back and listen strictly to the melody, listen to the way it flows within its own section, you know, there's not really any breaks or riffs in a lot of the melodic element. It really is the 16 or 32 bar phrases of flowing elements. I think the only thing that really has a sort of riffage to it would be in the sections with singing. And we do end up seeing uh, repeated uh, segments, especially in the vocals. A lot of the vocal melodies end up being cyclical or, or riff-based um, loop based, whatever you want to call it, where he has a single melody, maybe it's a four bar phrase for the vocals, and he'll repeat the four bar phrase over and over. But when it comes to lead instrument lines, a lot of them are not cyclical. A lot of them tend to be more linear. And it's fascinating, first of all, that he can find so many linear uh, lines in his mind to put into this song to keep it fresh for almost 30 minutes and also have such a back history of music uh, probably doing the same exact thing. Like the dude just seems to be an endless supply of really strong melodic elements, assuming a lot of his other songs are like this, not necessarily on the length, because I know even on this album, there are not, <laughs> yeah, this one's 30 minutes and then a six and a seven and a 10. <laughs> he definitely put the biggest work first uh but yeah just you know being on this level though of composition i kind of assume a lot of his other works on that same level and just thinking about all of the melodies that he's written that are linear that aren't lupus that aren't riffs just kind of uh blows my mind you know I, I i wonder how often he hits writer's block or if he even hits writer's block when it comes to melody um just because, like I said, there's so many good melodies in here. I don't know how long it would take me to come up with so many. <laughs> I don't know what it is as melodies. I can write great atmospheres and rhythms. When it comes to a melody, I'm like, ah, oh, man, this might take a couple days. <laughs> and I'm like trying to fill a 16-bar melody or something. Uh, I don't know. Inspiration for melodies just doesn't come to me as, as easily as uh, atmospheric or chordal or rhythmic. Uh, and just to hear so many in a single song kind of feels unfair. Like, man, I can't come up with one. This dude's got, you know, 30. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just another piece of, of the song that just has me super impressed by the variety of it. Um, and it's not like I'd say any of them are lacking. There's definitely some that are more uh, eye-catching than the others but there weren't any melodies i was like eh you know that one that one kind of didn't fit maybe he uh had to compromise on it you couldn't figure out a better way to no like every single melody is just beautiful throughout here so yeah i'm just i'm really impressed with the sheer variety of everything that's going on in here instrumentation melodic writing 
and uh, an atmosphere. 100%. Um, and then we have to talk about this. We have to talk about this. That three note motif that I noticed <laughs> around the 18 minute mark. Uh, da -da -da, that showing up everywhere in the last half of the song. Like, we could be in a, a brand new section. It has none of the same instrumentation, none of the same chord progressions, none of the same melodic writing as the previous, and yet it still has pockets of space where that little three-note motif can fit, and does fit, and gets played. Even when there isn't space specifically designed for it, it still shows up in ornamental ideas. Um... And it got to the point, I had mentioned, where I'd been conditioned to hear the setup for the motif, even if the motif doesn't get played, which I thought was phenomenal. I was hearing things that weren't there. I was expecting things that ended up not being there. Um, and it really makes me want to check out the first half of the song again and listen in for it and see if it's popping up. Uh, because, at least as far as I'm concerned, it stopped, it got more intense as we got up to the gate unlocking sample. And after that, it really didn't pop up at all. So assuming this is a journey to find this gate, it would make sense that the closer to this point we got, the more often we would hear this motif since I associate it with being this place that they have found. So it would make sense for it to be less common at the beginning, but I wonder if it's still you know, sprinkled throughout in a couple of sections, and it isn't until the end where he's, the um, the rate at which we're hearing it increases to the point that it becomes the only thing that's in the music. It's a motif that gets passed around from instrument to instrument to make a sort of hocketed version of the melody that we are hearing, and that was like about the 20-minute mark where, you know, the French horn would get it, and then the strings would get it, and then a guitar would get it. Um, and then we'd start inverting it. So instead of the da-da-da, we'd go da-da-da. And, you know, we'd change what key it's in. We'd raise it up a third. We'd bring it down a third. We'd bring it up a fifth or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's just... It was really weird to start hearing that. Because assuming I'm right, and this is a journey to find this gate... Maybe maybe the seventh gate of seven. I don't know. And enter into this place. If I were on this journey and I got closer to it, I'd begin to see the signs of this place. Maybe, you know, footsteps or, uh, you know, the denizens of this place, whatever creatures live here. You know, I'd start to see more and more sightings of them. And I love how they've implemented that auditorily and into my own experience where as I begin to pick up on this motif more and more I'm like oh we're getting closer and I see more and more of it and now it's everywhere like and I know we're getting close to the climax I absolutely love how they incorporated this journey like experience into my own listening experience of the song that is just phenomenal I could be completely wrong about this analogy and what this motif means but it's not going to erase my experience that I had here where it felt like I was exploring. And I absolutely love how that came about. Speaking of Seven, though, this is Seven Gates. The album is called Seven. And the number seven popped up nowhere in the music. Where is it? Now, ooh. Oh, <laughs> so remember I said, you know, we get to these gates, we open, we have the majesty of the orchestra swelling up, uh, it's getting more and more powerful, you know, this is the moment we've been waiting for, this is the triumphant uh, section of the story, and we end on this huge triumphant resolution in the strings and brass, and we fade out, and it's not much different, actually. In fact, we're hearing things we've already heard before. The crickets come back from earlier, and one of the melodic lines in the uh, acoustic guitar comes back, or something like that. And it's, uh... Yeah. All that... That big, bombastic energy, that big resolution, 
kind of led to nothing. And it kind of makes me feel like a, uh, that grass is always greener on the other side kind of thing. When you get there, you're like everything's great. And then you realize, you know, honestly, everything's the same as it was. And now the other side's looking a bit greener. That kind of deal where you get to the end of this big journey and it's supposed to be triumphant and you found this new awesome place. And you, honestly, it's really not that awesome. Maybe. This isn't the seventh gate. The idea that there was no seven throughout this song might mean that we were never actually anywhere near the seventh gate. We never actually made it where we wanted to. If we did, we might have entered into a seven four time signature or heard a seven beat phrase or, or a seven note phrase or heard a seven layer chord or something. But as it stands, there's no sevens anywhere and that could be a huge subversion there. I don't know. Uh, I I really am curious. If I ever get a chance to talk to this dude, that's going to be my one question. Maybe my only question. <laughs> hey, Anthony, I uh, I listened to your Seven Gates song. You know, some other stuff too. But I, wh where was the seven in it? Oh, you know, I just I didn't want to do it. It answers or whatever. I'm like, that's good enough for me. This interview's over. See ya. <laughs> like, that's literally my big question. There's so many allusions to Seven in the album, in the uh, title. I'm sure when I dig into the lyrics in a little bit, I'm sure there's going to be some stuff about Seven in there. And there's just not in the music at all. And it really set up my expectations for this and didn't happen. And I kind of expected maybe when the gates opened and the motif wasn't playing anymore, I was like, okay, we're going to go into a Seven idea. We've made it. We've made it to this place. This is where the seven should kick in, and it still didn't. In fact, not only was I a bit disappointed with no idea of seven coming in at all, I was listening to layers, I was listening to uh, chordal structures, I was listening to chord progressions, I was listening to the rhythm, time signature, like anything I could find that would be numerical or that could be represented numerically, and there's just no seven. I was even really hard trying to count out that almost free time string element right before the, the outro segment. And, you know, I, I really didn't land on anything, but I also really didn't land on a seven either. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was a bit disappointed with that. And then the song ends on its kind of lackluster element too. And I was just like, man, what a letdown. It reminds me of... Um, uh, Devin Townsend's Mighty Masturbator, where, you know, you have this huge bombastic over the top song that's like 15 minutes or something. And it's all in favor of like a two second punchline at the end of the song. And I know I remember the comments, you know, the song was more than that. But to me, that was my experience with it, it was a 15 minute way over the top song that set up a one sentence punchline uh you know it's this huge letdown at the end of the song like oh that's what the whole thing was about i'm kind of getting that here where i went on this massive journey and i feel like i didn't accomplish anything um give me one second though i'm gonna look into the lyrics i'll be right back and uh yeah we'll see what happens there okay um So there's eight stanzas. <laughs> I can't do this. Um. Yeah, it, I mean, it just seems to be about a journey. Uh, there's uh, let's see, somebody, uh, the narrator, I would suppose, uh, talks about this person who has seven options, seven doors. They have to find the right direction to reach something, possibly heaven. Um, but then there's also this element of seven planets, guide the soul, seven wonders, magic scroll. Um, not, uh, man. Uh, so like seven is important to elements of the song, even if they don't necessarily need to be about specifically what's going on, which seems to be this journey to find something. <sighs> Possibly heaven. 
uh, somewhere around the, the end point of the song, it says, now you see the root, so now you feel the mood. You have to seek salvation, welcome to the secret world, celebration, passion, definition, compassion. You found the road, seven is the hope, compassion. But then the final lines are seven planets, guide the soul, seven wonders, magic scroll, heaven. Uh, and I'm not sure what the planets have to do with heaven. Or what the seven wonders have to do. Or why there's a magic scroll. Unless the magic scroll would be a, a holy work, holy book. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of lost here. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm trying to read too much into this or not enough into this, but I'm definitely enjoying the musical journey a lot more than the lyrical one. That's not to say the lyrics are bad. They just seem to be a little bit more on the nose than a lot of the really interesting nuance that I heard and picked up on in the music. I was unfairly, possibly, hoping that the lyrics would be just as deep as the song was and it seems to be just a little bit more of a surface read which actually kind of lines up a bit with the sort of prog rock inspiration because that's kind of what I get from a lot of prog rock there's definitely some psychedelic metaphor kind of stuff going on in some of the songs but there's also a lot of prog rock music that's a bit on the nose lyrically and just incredible musically so I don't know. Like I said, I might have might have been a little unfair with my expectations there. Also, lyric writing and music writing are drastically different. And if I read this right, let me... Yeah, so Anthony... It doesn't say who wrote it. It says Anthony played keys and vocals and percussion and programming... Uh, then we have Max on guitars, Oha on uh, vocals, maybe backup vocals. Uh, we have a drummer, a bassist, narration, a, a drummer for different tracks, Bane, an accordion, oboe, flute recorder. Nobody, nobody listed as a lyricist, though. I don't know. The lyrics left me a little underwhelmed, but musically, I'm still blown away. There's just a lot of masterclass elements in here and like I said I would love to get a transcription of this and just kind of dive into what's making it tick some of the foundational ideas because uh, it's just it is fascinating work from beginning to end so those are my thoughts on seven by Carfagan this is where you guys come in hit me up in the comments let me know what you thought of this one if you enjoyed it or not uh, anything that stuck out to you anything that I touched on that maybe you'd like to expand on. And of course, if you have any additional information or context on this track or, uh, you know, the group Carfagan or Anthony Kalugan, let me know. I'm always interested in reading up on some of these guys uh, and, this, and the songs because it's just kind of blow my mind what's going on. And I always have questions walking away. <laughs> uh, above the comment section is the description box and there is a link for Linktree. It'll take you to this menu right here. It has links for everything related to the channel. You can support the channel through Patreon. You can follow me on Twitter, join the Discord community, purchase the merch, submit your own special selection. There's a ton of stuff. Go ahead and check it out. Above the description box, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC. We'll be looking at another vocal harmony song. It'll be our second to last one of the week. A really cool word for that is penultimate, one before the last. And, uh, oh, and a special selection, as we always do, because that, that's how we do. <laughs> Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.